Good morning, students. Welcome to chapel this morning. The beginning of a new school week for many of you, for those who had the early morning classes. Glad for a time to just sing and worship God this morning and hear in His Word. And uh, as we gather this morning, mid-semester for you as students, I know that's a point of weariness and keeping up and midterms coming up, but also living in a time where so much is going on around us that we'll take this time to just truly set our eyes upon Jesus and set this time apart that we'll be refreshed in Him. My name is Graham Bergen. I'm an adjunct professor here and also affiliate artist in the School of Music. Uh, also direct a summer school, Chehi Summer School of Music, which meets here uh, every summer. Uh, but it's my pleasure to be here with you this morning. And whenever I lead in worship here and I lead in music and chapel, that as you come in this door and you bring both the testimony of what God is doing but also the thirst and the longing on your hearts that we call upon him this morning. Would you stand as we open up in God's word and we start off in prayer together? Psalm 63 says, You God are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Let us pray. Lord, we have nothing here that we can give. We have nothing that is worthy before your eyes. Yet, Lord, you gave it all. And as Jesus gave it all on the cross, the fact that we can praise you as our Redeemer, we know that it has been fully satisfied. Lord, we are a thirsty people. We feel dry in so many ways. But, Lord, you are faithful. You are sovereign, and especially so when we don't even see and understand because we don't have the answers. But Lord, you've proven yourself in the past. May we, even in this time, call, it upon, call upon your name that we can trust in your faithfulness. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless grace. To this I hold my is only Jesus for my life is wholly bound to his oh how strange and divine I can sing all is mine yet not I but through Christ in me I dread, 
I know I am forgiven The future show The price it has been paid Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon And he was raised to is my 
stronger than darkness, new every morn. As sins they are many, His mercy is more. As sins they are many, His mercy is more. Let's pray. Lord, as we come before you, we have no right to approach your throne. And even to hear your word, we should be falling in trembling and fear, but for Christ. Lord, may we walk this week in boldness. Lord, for the answers that we do not have, for the anxiety we feel, or for the pride we can take on ourselves, may we come again at the foot of Christ, knowing that at your, cry, at, at your cross was the sacrifice for all, that we can boldly approach your throne, and we can hear your word, and even knowing where it pierces our heart by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would continue to mold us, that we would walk in your ways. Lord, we are thirsty, we are dry. May you minister to our hearts that we would drink from your well and that we would walk in the power of Christ. In your precious name we pray, amen. Please take your seats. Thank you, Graham. We are thirsty, although I'm not entirely sure we're dry. Thanks for braving it in here. I know it's a little bit of a nasty weather out there. Um, thankful for the warm and mostly dry place to meet. We got a few drips coming down from the ceiling. Um, that's not an attempt to uh, baptize any of you who haven't been baptized yet. Um, but uh, I'm certainly glad to see you all here. Everybody have a good weekend? Yes? Restful? Productive? Okay, what else, what else is left? Uh, wasn't fun, wasn't productive, wasn't restful. Fall break is coming up. Five days, five days till fall break, um, not in counting today, four days. You guys sticking around or you're going somewhere? A little bit of both? Yes? Okay. Much needed, much needed break and rest, I am sure. Um, but uh, glad to be here today, excited to hear our speaker. Let me tell you just a little bit about him before I invite him up. So our speaker... As the CEO of Esperanza Academy Charter Schools for the past 16 years, our speaker today oversees all aspects of Esperanza, Esperanza Academy, which uh, serves over 1,500 students in grades 6 through 12. Prior to joining Esperanza in 2003, our speaker was a principal at Calvary Christian Academy, junior and high school and senior high school. He has also served as a teacher, a middle school director, an athletic director, and coach before transitioning fully into educational administration. He is finishing up a master's degree from this fine institution. He holds a bachelor's degree in Bible and secondary education from Cairn University. In fact, he has a long history with this institution. Not only did he and three of his siblings graduate from Cairn, but so did his mom. He is a big fan of Philly sports, I hear, so we uh, probably don't want to bring up the Eagles with him this morning. He has three boys, including Nate, our current student body vice president. Please join me in welcoming Dave Rossi to the stage. Good morning again, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction, for the worship. Um, and yes, it's, uh, it's a dark day in Philly sports, as it usually is. There's more dark days than there are bright days. If there's any Steelers fans, congratulations. You won the, you won the championship of Pennsylvania. Not that that means anything, but um, you did win yesterday. Um, 
And uh, hopefully Nathan made it to chapel today. I'm not sure. But if he didn't, I'll be deeply offended if my own son didn't show up um, for chapel. But um, hopefully he made it. Uh, and as was mentioned, I do have um, wife Stephanie, who is a fifth grade teacher, um, has taught in Christian school. But this year also, is it, she's a teacher in cyber school, as most teachers are. But it is a real cyber school, uh, not a brick and mortar that's doing cyber education. Um, and my, my other son, Zach, is a, a freshman at uh, Liberty University, and then I do have a ninth grade son, Eli, as well, um, who is um, starting his high school years. So um, thanks for having me. Um, and also, um, good, there's a, there's a clock in the back. I, I hear you have some of you are going to lunch next, so I don't want to keep you. Um, as as uh, came up this morning, the, just the worship, um, our sins are many and his mercies are more, and I'm thankful for that. Um, and then with that thought, let's pray. Lord, we are thankful for your mercy because our sins are many, Lord. They're too many to count. And God, as I think about what you want to do with us even today, I pray that as usual, God, your messenger is flawed, but your message is not. And I pray that your message would go forth, God. I pray that you would do that despite the messenger. We thank you for your word that we can count on and that we can rely on. And um, we praise you for that. And we pray that you would just speak to us through your Holy Spirit. Um, and we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the chance to gather and to talk and to, Lord, think on the things that you may have for us this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, open them to Matthew 25. Um, and uh, we're going to be in uh, verse 31 through the end of the chapter there. Um, and as we do that, just a little bit about um, Esperanza. Esperanza charter schools are charter schools in North Philadelphia. Um, right down at Fifth and Hunting Park is where um, two of our schools are. We have, we have four schools all together, uh, all of them in North Philadelphia. Um, and the, the interesting thing about, about Esperanza um, is how it was, was founded and what drew me there. And I want to weave that into uh, this passage today. Esperanza, being public charter school, just like any other public school is, was founded by the Hispanic clergy of Philadelphia that then founded Esperanza, which is a faith-based organization where a group of pastors got together and said, we want to do things in the community that churches really aren't designed to do. Um, economic development, uh, running charter schools, things like that, um, all kinds of things Esperanza does, even from having the National Hispanic Prayer Breakfast, where the president typically comes every two years, um, whether it's Democrat, Republican, um, in the, the three administrations now, since I've been at Esperanza for the 16 years, it spanned three administrations, and we've had each administration go to the event that we host in Washington, and it's an exciting place to work at because it, it really is front lines. And it is serving people that are not like me. Um, and even from a language perspective, from an ethnicity perspective, uh, from a background perspective, um, it definitely is a different place than what I was accustomed to before the 16 years that I have now spent there. And it's out of that, the organization itself has, the organization that founded the schools uh, has a mission which is serving the least of these, a biblical mandate out of, of Matthew 25, 40, this passage. And as I've worked through that passage in the time there, and I was actually going to speak on something different, and the Lord kept bringing me back to Matthew 25, um, and, I, and so made a last-minute turn here, and we'll do this this morning. And it's my hope that um, as this passage has spoken to me through the years at Esperanza and has really developed the Lord has used to develop me. I hope it is the same. I also just want to say really quick, when, when I was a student here back two names ago, Philadelphia College of the Bible would have, the, the class I had after chapel was Dr. John Kaywood, who was the, um, the longtime head of the Bible department here. And when the speaker, we would come right after chapel and he would say, well, what did you think of the chapel speaker today? And we would give our opinions and um, most of the time he would say something like this. He would say, you know, because we would ask him, well, what did you think? And he would never answer the question. He would just say, well, it's important to teach the word, not just to talk about the word. Now, I didn't know how he was applying that to that speaker, but it's with that reverence or that idea of handling the word properly that um, I come to you today realizing that there's been a lot of chapel speakers before me, and it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Esperanza, which means hope in Spanish, 
as I mentioned before, the tagline, the mission is serving the least of these. And the passages I want to jump into, I'll just read quickly here, Matthew 25, 31. But when the Son of Man comes in, in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left then the king will say to those on his right, come, you, are, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and, and, and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and invite you or... Uh, in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of the least, of one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. And then he goes on to discuss that the goats or the, those who he categorizes them are the ones who did not serve the least of these. This is a really hard passage. This is a difficult passage. This is a serious passage. This is a passage where we've thrown around in evangelical culture who are the least of these. And just quickly from a, from a context standpoint, the least of these, as I read it, um, this is at the second coming and, and, and judging those who made it through the tribulation and separating the believers from the unbelievers. This passage is about division. It's dividing the right from the left. It's dividing the sheep from the goats. It's dividing those who served from those who didn't. In today's culture, we are very divided, aren't we? We are divided politically. We are divided racially. We are divided on issues. We are divided on everything from mask wearing to whatever it is you want to talk about, we live in a divided country. And in my years here in this country, it's more divided than I've ever seen it. And you know, all division is not, it's, it's, it's not unbiblical. There's this, this is biblical division here, but it's much different than the division that you and I are used to. The division here is dividing the redeemed from the lost the redeemed from the lost. After all, it's how God sees us. We are either redeemed or we're lost. We are, we are either on our way to an eternity with Jesus Christ or we are on our way to a Christless eternity. And I challenge you today as, I, as we go through this passage, think about that division. Think about how you and I see people. Do we see people in these categories? Do we see people... From a division perspective, when we look at people, do we see them as, to the extent that we know, someone who is redeemed and someone who is lost, and what does that do to our response to them? Or are we stuck in the divisions of the day where even the redeemed, us, are divided? And as I, as I embarked on serving at Esperanza over 16 years ago, I was very uncomfortable because God was calling me to serve people that were very different than me. He was asking me to serve not in a Christian leadership or a Christian school setting anymore, but now I was going into a, a neighborhood of North Philly that even though I grew up in Northeast Philly, Northeast Philly and North Philly are very different if you know Philly. And even in Northeast Philly, in North Philly, you can go neighborhood to neighborhood and it's very different as, as Philly is a city of neighborhoods. And one of the things I quickly learned was that I was serving people that were very different than me. And it was humbling. And it was nerve-wracking to an extent. And, and I think whenever God gives us a new assignment, right, we think, all right, am, am I going to be able to do this? How does God want me to serve? What does he want me to do? And what I take away from this passage is simplicity. He says he separated them from one another. The separation is the redeemed and, and those who are lost. And yet, we, we look at this, and the imagery to the shepherd would be separating the sheep and the goats. During the day, the sheep and the goats, the shepherd knows they're together. But when it comes nighttime and the temperature drops, it's time for the sheep and the goats to be separated because of the temperature. The goats need to be specially cared for because they are more susceptible to the cold. And so a shepherd would know that for a time, the sheep and the goats are going to be together, but then there's going to be a time where there's going to be separation. 
And when you think about that, the shepherd would understand the urgency of the shepherds hearing this passage. He would understand that, yes, the sheep and the goats will be together, even on earth now, as believers and unbelievers are together. But that is a finite time frame. There's an urgency to how we meet the needs of other people when it comes to understanding the needs of the lost. And also when it comes to understanding, building up and supporting those who are believers. And so this passage becomes real when you realize and, 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 and you see that the idea is what is distinguishing the sheep from the goats? Jesus is very clear. As much as you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. And what's the defining characteristic of someone who's redeemed? The defining characteristic of someone who re is redeemed is they're known for meeting the needs of other people. Think about that for a second. If all someone had to go on in my life was, and, I, and I, this is not teaching salvation by works. We know the Bible teaches salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. But the idea is here, that's, this is not what serving others isn't what causes them to be a sheep. It's the evidence of being a sheep. It's who we are as sheep. We're called to serve one another. And if I look at my own life and I say, wow, is that what I'm known for? If people were to look at my life, and, and more importantly, as my Savior looks at me, is my life marked by service to others? And then I look at the service in here, and you look at the actions that are taking place. If someone's hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. If they're sick, visit them, unless they're quarantined with COVID. If, they are, if they're in prison, visit them. If they lack clothing, clothe them. One of the things the Lord made it clear to me through interaction with this passage in my service, which I was daunted by in terms of how am I going to serve in this environment, which I never served before, was serving others isn't complicated. Can I give someone something to eat? Can I give them something to drink? Can I provide clothing if they need it? Can I visit someone when they're sick? Can I visit someone in prison? The answer is yes. It doesn't take a strategic plan for an individual to meet the needs of other people. It's not complicated, but it does take sacrifice, it does take intentionality, and it does take time. A lot of which sometimes I know myself as a selfish individual may be unwilling to give. But for my life to be marked by one of service, I have to put those things aside and I have to say, that is what God wants me to do. And I also, as I thought through this passage, it's not always clear what the needs of another person are. Sometimes it's painfully obvious. I drive through North Philadelphia and it's very obvious sometimes what the needs of people are. Head a little bit to the east by Kensington and Allegheny and see the drug culture there and you can see what the needs of people are. Poverty sometimes can be seen. Sometimes it's hidden. And God tells us to meet the needs of other people, but there's sometimes when those needs are obvious, there's sometimes when those needs are covered up. Because as human beings, we like to cover up our needs at times because we want to be seen as sufficient. And so one of the first things I learned was the idea of asking God, God, show me what the needs of the people are right in front of me because I'm not always smart enough or observant enough or even others centered enough to know what those needs are. I can't give someone something to eat if I don't know they're hungry. I can't visit someone in prison if I haven't observed the fact that they're in prison. I can't meet the simple needs of another person if I don't know what those needs are. I remember distinctly, it was probably about 12 years ago, and this had a, a major impact on uh, my ministry down at, at Esperanza. I was, it was a parent-teacher conference night, and as an administrator, as a head of school, I'm not meeting with the parents. The parents are coming in, they're going to meet with their teachers. Um, sometimes they have their kids with them, sometimes they don't, and there's, there's, you know, there's meetings that are already scheduled and set up. I remember distinctly standing at the front door of the school, and this dad came through. Had his his wife with him, and he had two high school kids with him. He was going to meet, I'm sure, with um, the teachers of, of, his, of, his, um, of his children. And he caught my eye. As he walked through those front doors of the school, he, he was in his work coveralls. 
It was probably about 5.30. In my mind, I'm making these connections. He's probably coming right from work. I could see that he had gotten out of the separate car than his wife did and his kids did. So he's probably meeting his family there. And as he walked through the door, for something made me catch his eye, and I looked at his face. And to this day, I get choked up about it. I saw a man who felt like he had the weight of the world on his shoulders. I could see the struggle of a dad. I could, see, I could see the stress of someone who rushed from work to come, and I don't know what he's dealing with. I don't know what his economic situation was. I don't know how things were going with his teenage sons. I don't know what his marriage was like. I don't know what his financial situation was like. I don't know what his work life was like and what kind of day he had, but he looked tired. He looked fatigued. He looked like he had a million things on his mind and he didn't know what to accomplish first. You might say, how could you get that just from looking in his eyes? And all I knew the Lord was saying is, greet this man. Let him know how important it is that he's here and how thankful we are as a school that he's here. Say something kind to him because it seems like he needs it. But that's not what just caught me about this man. What caught me about this man was I looked at him and I saw his work coveralls and I immediately flashed back to my own father who would come home from work and me as a kid and we, we, we are with our parents. We don't know what our parents are going through. We don't know the struggles they faced. We don't know the heartaches they have. Sometimes we know them, sometimes we don't. But to know what this dad was going through, for some reason it flashed back to my own father and watching him come home from work, tired, eating dinner, and then going out and working another job and even another job after that. And immediately I had this compassion for this man, not even knowing his situation because I saw my own father. And one of the things the Lord taught me that day was, you work with people that are different than you. And one of the things I learned about diversity early on, even before I worked at Esperanza, is God created different races. He created ethnic. He's, he's the founder of it. He created skin color. And God wants us to celebrate his creation. And he wants us to celebrate diversity. And he wants us to celebrate the differences of his incredible creation. But there's also something else that's important when you're serving someone who's different than you are. It's the reality that in many ways we're all the same. We have the same struggles. We have the same cares in this world. We want the same thing for our kids. And there's basic needs in every human being that need to be met. And that evening marked a new compassion in me for the people that I come in contact with, and I never had a conversation with that dad to find out what the issues were, because there wasn't time and the Lord wasn't calling me to do that. He was calling me to show kindness. And one of the things I looked at was just meeting the simple needs of other people. It's not complicated, but it does require a heart that says, God, today, show me what you want me to see today, because on my own, I won't see it. Show me who the people are in my life that are already around me who have needs to be met that if I'm not observant to them, I'll never know. And God, burn in me a compassion for other people to reach them for you, to show compassion. You might say, yeah, those are simple needs, Dave, but I'm a college student. I don't even have a provision for myself, let alone to give to someone else. Yeah, God call, does call us to give to others, but sometimes you don't even need to have the possession that he's going to ask you to give. I think of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Those disciples were there. They didn't bring any food, neither did Jesus. Little boy brings fish and loaves. And what happens? 5,000 and more are fed, probably upwards of 15,000 that day, by disciples who didn't have a thing. They had nothing. All God says, you serve. I will provide everything you need to meet the needs of the people that I place in your path. And then what happened? They serve, and guess what? There's 12 baskets left over for them. Because not only does God provide for me what I'm going to need to meet the needs that he wants me to meet, but then he's actually going to provide for me in the end, so I'm not going to go without. And he's calling us to be marked as a people that do that. Is Cairn University known for serving others? Am I known for serving others? Are you known for serving others? Does the world look at the church and say, that's what they look like. 
I look at the divisions we have today, and, and I remember a day clearly where I was walking through the high school cafeteria. Another administrator said to me, you see that student over there? He happened to be the valedictorian, the coming valedictorian of the class. He clearly had the highest grade point average. And he said, um, that student's undocumented, and he doesn't know it, which means no financial aid. He didn't know that he was undocumented. Nobody told him. He came to this country when he was two. Only country, he's, only land he's ever known, only home he's ever known. And that's, that student was going to find out. And when we educate students in a public school, just like any other public school, we can't ask them whether they're undocumented or whether they're allowed to be in the country. It's not, we're not allowed to. It's illegal as a public school. We serve who comes. And at that moment, I realized, wow, he's got a, he's got a future ahead of him that he didn't bargain for. And see, these things are political issues to a lot of us. There was, a, there was research done that I saw from back in 2015, and it was to the evangelical community. And what it said was, is you can, you can pick any of the above answers. You have to, it wasn't either or. So it was, how do you feel towards immigration or immigrants in the United States? One of the answers was, they are a threat to the economy. One of the answers was, again, this is to evangelicals. One of the answers was, you are... Um, it's a chance to reach people for Jesus Christ. Another one was it's a chance to show love to other people. And again, you didn't have to pick one. You could pick all of the above. 48% of the evangelical community that was surveyed in 2015 said the number one thing, 48% said they're a threat to the economy. 42% said it's an opportunity to reach them for Jesus Christ. And yet we see politics. We see the left or the right. We see what American culture and the media and political parties and whatever we see this on, we see it through that lens. You know what God sees? He sees redeemed and lost. And he sees us as the conduit to meet those needs. And when you look at things that way and you say, God, show me the issues that are in front of me and help me to see things from your perspective. You know, in Romans 15, Paul says the calling on his life is to take the gospel where it hasn't been taken before. Because he doesn't want to build on another man's foundation. What would Paul think if he was living in modern day United States and he was looking at the issue of immigration? Do you think Paul would be thinking, well, it's a threat to the economy more than it is a chance to reach people for Christ? We, would, we laugh at that. But yet, as a group, that was the number one. Of course, none of us were asked that because we would have had the right answer. Um, but uh, we see this and we see obviously how perspective can get skewed and it can get taken off course from meeting the needs of those that God places in front of us. So again, the distinguishing mark of a believer in Jesus Christ is that they meet the needs of others. And in order to meet the needs, we need to see the need. It's a serious passage. And as we think about what it is, and I'll, I'll, I'll close with this as time is short, the, the actual passage is talking about the least of these, the least of my brethren. Many scholars look at that as being um, the, the Jewish believers during the tribulation and to the fact that as they were persecuted that there were other believers that ministered to them. What, whatever your view on that passage is, and I'll leave that up to you as you study it and, and, um, and so forth. But guys, we live in perilous times. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. We're in the middle of a divisive, a divisive election. We're in the middle of, of mores changing, a, you know, morality changing in front of us. We, we're in we're in a place where there's more need than we've ever seen. There's economic uncertainty because of the pandemic and, and all other things, and there's perilous times. But that just means there's more needs. So that means we live in opportunistic times. And I'll share this with you just before you go, and you're going to say, Dave, you're all over the place, right? But here's, here's one of the things. If we're looking at even meeting the needs of other believers, eight Christians are killed every day for their faith around the world. Every week, 182 churches or, or Christian buildings are attacked. Every month, 309 Christians are imprisoned unjustly. 260 million Christians worldwide live in a land that is 
high or severe in terms of its levels of persecution. You might say, what does that have to do with everything else you talked about? It sounds like there's just way too much. How do I even speak to that? There's the needs of the unbelievers. There's the needs of the saints being persecuted. There's the needs of believers and unbelievers all around us. Where do I start? How do I live out Matthew 25 in the midst of all those needs? You don't have to look far, but you do have to look. And you have to ask God, what is it you want me to do today? What are the needs you want me to meet? And I'm, I'm convinced that God has wired all of us to meet specific needs. He's preordained acts for us to do. God, what is it that you want me to do? And as you leave today, I pray that it would be fresh on your heart that you would be marked as Matthew 25 is with the sheep, that we would be a people that meet the needs of others, the ones that he's placed us in front. And when you are meeting the needs of someone who's different than you, have confidence. You have everything you need to do the job God wants you to have or wants you to do. He will meet those needs. He will give you what you need, and he will also take care of you in the process. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for how much you love us. I thank you for saving us. I thank you for our eternal security. God, help us to be a people that lives out your faith by meeting the needs of others around us. We praise you for the opportunity. Go before us. Give us fresh opportunities today. Give us a fresh perspective, fresh observation today. And God, thank you for your word. And thank you for the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a great day, everyone.